You know, this time thought I'd have felt guilty about doing something like this. But this ain't one of those times. We made this video to show you that we should always do our own research in order to check and verify everything which is said in a video. Meet Jixuan and Sebastian, who think that they've actually debunked one of my videos. All mistakes exposed. So let's go through all the arguments Thunderfoot brings forth against the Hyperloop and debunk them one by one. Yeah, this, this ain't gonna end well. Check and verify everything which is said in a video. Of course, this also applies to our videos. Remember, you wanted this. Have you ever wondered what it would look like if two exceptionally gullible uh, sorry, Elon Musk fans with no experience in science or dealing with vacuum systems tried to debunk a doctor with decades of experience in dealing with vacuum systems? <laughs> you're, you're about to be killed by a Zamboni. Oh, yes. This isn't going to end well. But don't worry, they've got a holy document to protect them, the white paper. On page 54, section 4.5.2, it is written, Elon Musk said it, they believed it, that settles it. No matter what reality has to say on the subject. Yes, they're gonna debunk my Hyperloop videos with uh, academic arguments of the intellectual caliber of if we want infinite power, why don't we just plug a power strip into itself? With science understanding like that, I think you can see why I'm in mortal peril from being debunked by these people. I mean, let me just give you a flavor of the caliber of people we're talking about. I'll preface this one with, yeah, most people know that if you get a bar of metal and heat it up, the metal expands. And the amount it expands per degree Celsius is a expansion coefficient. Complicated stuff. Difficult to mangle that one. Over to you, Waxon and Sebastian. Then he goes on to talk about how the temperature differences would make Hyperloop impossible because it would expand or contract by so much along its entire length that it would vary by an incredible 300 meters in the case of 40 degrees Celsius temperature difference between both ends. Now, I thought I made this idiot proof in my original video. I really did. I, I didn't think it would be possible for someone to not understand what I was talking about, that, you know, on a cold day, it's going to be shorter, and on a hot day, it's going to be longer. Uh, here is the original video. Just see what you think. Most people know that if you just have, say, bridges, you need an expansion joint in them. So let's take a look at the expansion for steel. It's about 13 parts per million per degree Celsius. So let's say the temperature range is going to be between freezing point and 40 degrees Celsius. That's basically a, a hot day, which means the overall length of this tube is going to vary by about four, 500 parts per million and that sort of thing, which means that the overall length of the Hyperloop from the coldest day to the hottest day will vary by about 300 meters, about the length of three football fields. Yeah, so there you go. Clearly stated in the video, I'm talking about the length between the hottest day and the coldest day, and it's there in the graphics. He's not just going to miss that, he's going to mangle the physics, which, let's be honest, the linear expansion of things when they get hot, not the most complicated of concepts to grasp. He is going to mangle that to the point of unlimited power. And then, He's going to smugly conclude that he debunked me good. It sometimes helps to do a bit of physics, you know? But wait, wait. This argument would only count in the case that we would see, for example, minus 20 degrees Celsius at one end of the Hyperloop, and then this temperature would gradually increase all the way to plus 20 degrees Celsius at the other end of the Hyperloop. Because that is how the temperature variation formula, which he probably used, works. <laughs> oh, that is just so precious. 
I mean, I, I, I laugh out loud every time I, I hear him do that because uh, it's so mangled. You know, quite often it helps if you start from an understanding of the physics. And the maths is just something that describes what you understand. And so, no, the formula doesn't say that it depends on the temperature of both ends of the object. <laughs> if you understood the concepts, that's not what it's describing. It's describing how the length varies with temperature, not the different temperatures of the ends of an object. However, in reality, of course, there would never be a scenario where we would witness a 40 degrees Celsius temperature difference along a length of 600 kilometers. Imagine having minus 20 degrees Celsius in San Francisco, while at the same time having plus 20 degrees Celsius in Los Angeles. I mean, it just keeps on digging. Seriously, if you understood the concepts, you would understand that if it was minus 20 at one end and plus 20 at the other, the overall length wouldn't actually change at all. You know, the position of them might change somewhat, but the length of the tube would contract by exactly the same at one end as it expands at the other. I mean, this is the thing. He just picks up a formula, makes up what he thinks the terms are, and thinks he's debunked something. Now, how this actually would work is that, of course, we would see many temperature fluctuations along the entire length of the Hyperloop. Hi, I'm Sebastian. I studied physics also in Munich, Germany. Meaning the Hyperloop would contract, expand, contract, expand, contract, expand, and so on and so forth along the entire length. Try not to speak. Is this a piece of your brain? <laughs> I mean, he just keeps digging with this alternative physics world. I mean, even if that were how it works, that's not how it would work. What we're actually talking about here is the temperature, say, during the day and the temperature during the night, because it's going to be day everywhere on the Hyperloop. So it's going to have a length during the day, which will be longer than the length during the night when it's cold. And that length variation will be about 300 meters. And on top of that, you get the seasonal variations, where you get the length on the hottest day and the length on the coldest day. <laughs> this is not difficult stuff to understand, but he just keeps mangling it. Therefore, in reality, the length contractions and expansions would just on average cancel each other out along the way. And the net result would be a quite negligible contraction or expansion, which is, by the way, addressed in the Hyperloop white paper on page 5, where it is suggested to use a telescope tube for entrance and exit of the tube to accommodate for these length variations. Yeah, I mean, you had to literally not understand reality to make it conform to the white paper. But sure, <laughs> all praise to the white paper. Mathematically speaking, the sum over all length variations along the entire tube is according to the length, contraction and expansion formula equal to the sum over alpha times all the temperature fluctuations along the entire tube. Alpha being the expansion parameter, so therefore a constant. Uh, let me just add a slight correction that'll actually make your interpretation of this math actually make more sense. Alpha is the white paper, which transforms what all of these terms actually mean into something else. We can pull alpha in front of the sum so that we have alpha times the sum over all temperature fluctuations. But since the temperature goes up, down, up, down, and so on and so forth, delta t has an alternating sign. So plus, minus, plus, minus, and so on and so forth. Therefore, the sum over all the delta t's will on average cancel each other out. Yeah, at the moment, this picture does a pretty good job of describing Sebastian's level of understanding of this problem. So no, this is not as simple as just to say plus 40 degrees temperature difference and then I take the entire length. Actually, yes, it's exactly that simple. You know, there are many temperature variations along the way and many expansions and contractions along the way that cancel each other out to a large extent. Yeah, <laughs> so in order to debunk me, uh, they had to claim that the Hyperloop's average temperature 
during day and night is exactly the same because it all cancels out over small distances. <laughs> you know, that whole thing about you thinking it gets cold at night doesn't really happen. And warm during the day, that doesn't happen either. You know, this way they can show that the white paper was correct. It may not therefore surprise you that our uh, elite Elon Musk scientists here eh, sometimes have to, uh, how shall we say, twist things to make them easier to debunk. You know, kind of like a straw man, like, say, for instance, this. Now, he starts the video by saying that it's impossible to build a 600 kilometer long vacuum chamber. Why, that's odd. That doesn't really sound like something I would say. And it's also bizarre. Why don't they actually take the quote of what I'm saying out of the original video? Yeah, why, why, why do they have to say what I said? Well, let's take a look at what I actually said, shall we? It's also much cheaper to build. It's about one-tenth the cost of the proposed California high-speed railway system. This means that tickets could cost as little as $25. A thousand kilometers per hour in a vacuum tube for less than the construction costs of what is currently proposed for the high speed rail connection. It will generate more power than it uses by solar panels, and a ticket will only cost about 20 bucks. Yeah, and it's complete bullshit. Now, sure, the principle is fine, it's just not viable in practice. You know, it's like the solar roadways thing. It sounds great, but in reality, it's just bullshit made up by snake oil salesmen. Or the mindlessly optimistic daydreaming of those who just don't want that bitter taste of reality. The first real challenge is simply the near impossible goal of building a 600 kilometer long vacuum chamber. Now, he starts the video by saying that it's impossible to build a 600 kilometer long vacuum chamber. No, he says it would be nearly impossible. Like, say for instance, the examples of solar roadways, you know, where they were claiming all we had to do was coat all of our roadways with solar panels, which would be cripplingly expensive and not even remotely cost effective. That's not the same thing as saying it's impossible. It's just saying it would be dumb to do it. By the way, we shall often refer to Elon's legendary Hyperloop white paper from 2013. Oh, glory to the white paper. Now, on page 12 of the white paper, it is detailed that, in fact, the Hyperloop will not contain a perfect vacuum, but low pressure air at a pressure of 100 Pascal. And it is therefore classified as a medium vacuum. A medium vacuum can be kept up with vacuum pumps every few hundred meters quite easily as compared to what would be necessary to achieve an extremely high vacuum or absolutely perfect vacuum. Oh, wow. <laughs> People who mangle basic physics concepts. I mean, we're not just talking about minor numerical errors or something. We're talking about people who mangle basic concepts and now can lecture me on vacuum systems. Fine. Well, let's start with the obvious. What scientists call different levels of vacuum is actually kind of an irrelevance here. You're talking about removing 99.9% of the air. That means you'd actually need some pretty sophisticated kit to tell the difference between that and a perfect vacuum. Trust me, I've got half a dozen gauges in the lab that do this sort of thing. So yeah, their uh, medium vacuum of the Hyperloop is 99.9% towards a perfect vacuum. You remove that remaining one part in a thousand extra air and you have a perfect vacuum. And for certain, for your body, this will be basically absolutely indistinguishable from a perfect vacuum. Thunderfoot makes this argument for a perfect vacuum, which is clearly stated in the white paper, will not be employed in the Hyperloop. That is the whole point of Hyperloop, not to have a perfect vacuum inside the tube, but a medium vacuum, which basically is very low pressure air. Oh, <laughs> God. Uh, once you're getting out of this sort of level of pedantry, all vacuums are just low pressure air. It's extremely easy to upkeep the medium vacuum in the Hyperloop by just having vacuum pumps arranged along the length of the tube, say every 100 meters. Uh, yeah, these people have never worked with a vacuum system 
in their lives. I study mathematics and actuarial science, but rarely my real passion is baking. Look, if it was a perfectly sealed system, all you need to do is pump the right amount of air out of it and then close the valves and you're done. You don't need to do any more pumping. Reality isn't quite that nice. All systems leak. And as a general rule, the bigger the system is, the more difficult it is to find the leaks on it. Say, for instance, if you had a 600 kilometer long tube, finding the leaks on it would be almost impossible. So if you've resigned yourself to your system leaking, then you have to continuously pump on it. Now, the way that they're suggesting doing it is you have pumps every 100 meters, did they say? Which means that you're going to have some 6,000 pumps along the length of the Hyperloop. Now, there's another rule about vacuum systems. You know, the bigger they are, the harder it is to find leaks. And the more seals there are on them, the more likely it is to leak. And they're proposing, out of the bag, having 6,000 pumps on this system. That's 6,000 potential leak points. <laughs> Add to that that those aren't realistic numbers. If you want to pump this Hyperloop down in a sensible amount of time, I did this calculation in my last video, you need about one pump every 10 meters, meaning that you would need something like 60,000 seals at least on this vacuum chamber just to pump it down in a sensible amount of time, like a day or so. He then says that the outside air pressure would be just far too high and that it would crush the tube. Oh boy, why do I get the sinking sensation that you're about to again use your fearsome ability to not understand basic concepts of physics to prove that I'm wrong? We can calculate the stress acted upon a tube quite easily. This is basic engineering mechanics. Boy, does this guy love putting in the overcomplicated maths to dig his own grave. We have a radial component of the stress called sigma 2 and an axial component of the stress called sigma 1, as shown in this drawing here. Now for Hyperloop, we can use the thin wall approximation, for which the inner diameter r of the tube Spoiler alert, he's about to do the metaphorical equivalent of proving that birds can't fly because steel is heavier than feathers. They're both a kilogram, but steel's heavier than feathers. Must at least be 10 times larger than the thickness T, which is the case for Hyperloop, of course, and we get a very simple formula to calculate the hoop stress, sigma h. Now we find that sigma h is the difference of the internal and the external pressure. Yes, kids. Today on Storytime, an Elon Musk fan is reading out a completely irrelevant formula. Times the external diameter divided by two times the thickness. So pi is the interior pressure, pe is the exterior pressure, de is the external diameter, and t is the thickness of the tube. Which is for a typical Hyperloop about one inch or 2.54 centimeters of steel. But steel's heavier than feathers. The internal pressure PI is 100 pascal, the external pressure PE is atmospheric pressure, so 100 kilopascal, the external diameter DE is 2 meters, we therefore get a hoop stress, so a circumferential stress of 3.4 megapascal, the longitudinal stress. Honestly, when you understand where he's going with this, it's just painful to watch a man screw up this badly. The longitudinal stress, by the way, is the hoop stress divided by 2, so we get a longitudinal stress of 1.7 megapascal. And now, of course, the prize question, is one inch of steel strong enough to withstand up to 3.4 megapascal of stress? All right, let's put this Muppet out of his misery. If only there was some simple way I could demonstrate it in my uh, kitchen using a compressor and a vacuum pump. Yeah, and why not a Coke can? So let's start by trying to see just what the uh, what sort of stress a Coke can will take. So obviously we're going to have to apply pressure to it, so we're going to need a way of... Uh, you know, sealing all this up, and so let's start by getting that off. So, I don't know, I'm going to do this quite yet. Let's see how it goes, there we go. See, that's not a bad way of doing it. Go along those lines. I just need a way of actually having this all hold together. I'm just going to use hot glue in the first instance, because yeah, it's quick, it's cheap. <laughs> yeah, there you go, hot glue. Yeah, it's nicely warming up. There 
my guy, we have <laughs> the most prettily seal up Coke can ever. Good. So, what sort of pressure do you think this will take before it goes bang? Or more, maybe more interestingly, what sort of vacuum do you think it'll take before it goes Good. Good. So, I'm not a man with a lot of uh, patience, so let's go straight for it, right? In the moment, this is a compressor, and the compressed gas comes out of here. And there's not much pressure in there at the moment, so let's get some pressure in there. Now let's start with two bar, okay? Okay, good. So now we have two bar of pressure. Two bar of pressure, by the way. It's, you usually hold two bar with your finger. Oh, it, it's leaking somewhere else, so I can hold two bar with my finger, okay? So... <laughs> the question, will our Coke can, let's zoom out for this, will our Coke can take two bar of pressure? Right, right, I don't know if this will work, so, let's pressurise it. Yeah, yeah. There you go. So it's now actually hard to push because it's pressurized and if I take the pressure off, which is down like this, right, now it's soft to push. Yeah. So it takes two bar, it's not bad. Okay, let's do that again, nice and soft to push. Pressurized and it's hard to push. Wow, it takes two bar. I wonder if we make it three bar. This might be pushing it a bit. So anyway, you see we're up to three bar. Soft, soft, soft. Fresh, oh, that's getting hard to push now. That's really getting hard to push. So that's three bar. Right. Awesome. So that will take up to three atmospheres of pressure. So it must be able to take minus one, right? Well, let's go try, shall we? Sweet. So he's now hooked up to the vacuum system. And as you can see, there is one atmosphere of pressure in there at the moment. So let's start this up. Oh, wow. Wow. I only took a tenth of an atmosphere out and look what happened. That's what a reduction of a tenth of an atmosphere did, even though it took up to three bars of pressure. And let's just do this for good measure. Oh no, no, that's, that's half an atmosphere of pressure. That's basically all of it. <laughs> That's, that's a disaster. How can that be? It took three atmospheres of positive pressure. Let's look up the tensile strength of, for example, 304 stainless steel. Oh my word, he doesn't understand the difference between compression and tension, but fine. Tensile strength is how strong you have to stretch something before it breaks. So in pressurizing a tube term, it's how much pressure you have to put in before the tube explodes, before it ruptures. Not so quite the same off. thing as whether it'll oh, actually wow, go wow. under a vacuum. Which is a familiar steel because Starship steel is quite similar to it. We find a yield strength of 215 megapascal and an ultimate strength of 505 megapascal. Great! That means you can put lots of pressure into your tube before it explodes. Not quite sure what relevance that has to how easily the tube will collapse, but Keep going. Now this means that the steel starts deforming at 215 megapascal and completely breaking at 505 megapascal. But we found that our hoop stress is only 3.5 megapascal, the longitudinal stress even lower. 
This basically means that the hype loop steel could withstand 63 times more pressure than the atmospheric pressure before it would even start deforming and even 148 times more pressure until it would start breaking. So yeah, there you go. The steel is more than strong enough to withstand the external atmospheric pressure without problems. Yes, congratulations. The Hyperloop would be able to take a lot of pressure on the inside of the tube when the structure would be in tension. And the compression? Not quite so much. The even dumber thing, of course, is even my aluminium can here didn't actually reach the uh, tensile strength of aluminium. This wafer thin sheet of aluminium, even though it was under a total vacuum, completely crushed, of course, but there was no rupture in the actual aluminium anywhere. This actually held the vacuum. So I guess this would be this wafer thin aluminium would also, in his mind, be a perfect material for making the hype loop out of because it can take the stress as well. So yeah, there you go. The steel is more than strong enough to withstand the external atmospheric pressure without problems. It sometimes helps to do a bit of physics, you know? Oh boy. Oh boy. Or alternatively, you could just look up things like tank collapses, right? So he's going to claim that the oh, one inch thick steel, it's about 25 millimeters, is about a hundred times thicker than it needs to be. So let's just be generous and say that a millimeter thick steel would actually be perfectly good enough to hold a vacuum in his mind. Let's take a look at some vacuum collapses, shall we? It sometimes helps to do a bit of physics, you know? However, while there are some very dramatic demonstrations of things under vacuum being crushed by the atmosphere, and this is basically releasing that energy that I was telling you about earlier, there was, however, a Mythbusters experiment that showed that a tanker truck under vacuum can be stable. That's the sound of disappointment, ladies and gentlemen. These tank cars are actually pretty tough little bastards. That's until they put a dent in their tanker truck. And then, boom. It sometimes helps to do a bit of physics, you know? And now comes our favorite argument, which we find kind of hilarious, honestly. He says that if there is a rupture in the Hyperloop pod, the people inside the pod would brutally suffocate. Okay, so the people working at those Hyperloop companies are total idiots, like... Well, I'm not sure about that. But the geniuses who worked on the Elon Musk Hyperloop didn't realize the iron rusts and it gets wet. <laughs> what do you know? companies are total idiots like who never heard of a safety system right and also the air inside a pod just instantly vanishes in a split second if there is a leak in the pod actually yeah that's about right you see it turns out gas molecules travel at about the speed of sound so if all of a sudden they're not actually being held by a wall or something they vanish at about the speed of sound which means you can get an awful lot of gas through a fairly small hole. Now, I mean, just as an example from this video alone, you'll recall that the pressure that I had in my little Coke can here was three atmospheres. So when I make a small hole in the system by unplugging it from the pressure system, all the pressure, all the gas has to go through that tiny hole for it to equilibrate from three atmospheres to one atmosphere. How long do you think this is gonna take? That's really getting hard to push. So that's three bar. Okay, so the people working at those Hyperloop companies are total idiots, like who never heard of a safety system, right? Now let us take a look what the white paper has to say about this. The white paper, all, all praise to the white paper. For example, page 54, section 4.5.2. In the event of a minor leak, 
The onboard environmental control system would maintain capsule pressure using the reserve air carried on board for the short period of time it will take to reach the destination. Well, actually, if the leaks are small enough, you don't even have to do that. In the case of a more significant depressurization, oxygen masks would be deployed as in airplanes. Yes, he is legitimately parading Elon Musk's ignorance of how gases behave in a vacuum. Sit down, kid, and I'll explain to you why the white paper is dumb. You see, you can only breathe if the pressure on the inside of your lungs is the same as the pressure on your skin. Awesome. So at the moment, I don't have any problems breathing. And the reason I don't have any problems breathing is because the pressure of the air that's pushing on my lungs and the pressure that's pushing on the outside of my chest is exactly the same, which basically means there's no real resistance to me breathing beyond the viscosity of the gas. Yes, I can breathe out. <sighs> And this is, it requires almost no force whatsoever. However, that's not universally true. Say for instance, my body was exposed to a vacuum and I needed someone to feed me a certain gas pressure of oxygen such that I can still survive. I need a certain minimum pressure of oxygen going to my lungs. Without that, I can't survive. Now, fortunately, I don't have to do this in a vacuum because we only need to know what's the difference in pressure between what pushes on the outside and what I can exert with my lungs. And we can do this in two ways. The first one is if the pressure on the outside of my body is higher than the gas that I'm breathing, there comes a point when it's going to squeeze the breath out of me and I can't breathe in anymore. So this is like you know, a bunny getting constricted by a snake or something apart from the same thing just works if it's gas pressure if you have more gas pressure pushing on the outside then you have going into your lungs that you just can't breathe them anymore and likewise you get the opposite effect which is when there is more gas pressure going into your lungs than is pushing on the outside and you just get blown up like a balloon and there comes a point when you you can't breathe out anymore so how can we get an estimate of that well fortunately I have a little pressure meter here who currently says uh, this is atmospheric pressure here, which is about, well, 1000 millibar is one atmosphere. And so I can see what sort of pressure difference I could still blow out at by seeing what's the maximum pressure I can get with my lungs. And likewise, I can do the opposite. What's the, uh, the minimum pressure I can still breathe in that by seeing how hard I can suck. Okay, blowing first. And it does. That that's genuinely if you're blowing with your lungs, you are doing really well if you can get up to 1.1 atmospheres. Uh yeah, 100 millibars extra pressure exerted with your lungs. And likewise, let's see if we can do that the opposite. Let's see if we can do that in suction. Right, so awesome. You can just about handle a difference between the pressure on the inside of your lungs and what's pushing on your body of about a tenth of an atmosphere. Beyond that, you either can't breathe in because there's too much pressure squeezing it out of you, or you can't breathe out because there's too much pressure going into your lungs. Now, if you're in space, obviously the pressure pushing on the outside or in a vacuum, the pressure on the outside of your body is zero. So what's the minimum air pressure you actually need to live? And it's about 0.2 atmospheres, right? 0.2 atmospheres of oxygen is what you need to live. Uh, so if you're in a vacuum that without a pressure suit to help squeeze your body a bit, there is no way that you would be able to survive decompression like this. Because even if I give you a gas mask that perfectly fits over your mouth, that feeds you pure oxygen, all it's gonna do is blow your body up and you will never be able to breathe out because there is gas pressure being fed into your lungs that's blowing up like a balloon and you do not have the strength in your lungs to push it out again.
He then says that in a plane, oxygen masks would be deployed in case of emergency, which would not be the case in the Hyperloop. Wrong! Wrong! As we said before, on page 54, section 4.5.2, it is written The white paper, the white paper, all oh, glory, glory to the glory white to paper. The paper. It is written in the case of a more significant depressurization, oxygen masks would be deployed as in airplanes. Yeah, when you're in a plane at altitude, the atmospheric pressure outside is about 0.2 atmospheres, but it's regular air, so it's 80% nitrogen, 20% oxygen, so there's not a lot of oxygen there. So you need to get more oxygen, but yeah, can't apply more pressure to the body very easily. So what you do is you get a mask that supplies about 0.2 atmospheres of oxygen, and then you just breathe the pure oxygen, and because the pressure on the inside and the pressure on the outside is the same, you can breathe that fine. Yeah, I can't do that in a hyperloop because the oxygen will diffuse away before you can breathe it in. Remember, gas in a vacuum diffuses away at about the speed of sound. Alternatively, if you stick the mask to someone's face, it just blows them up like a balloon. In the case of a more significant depressurization, oxygen masks would be deployed as in airplanes. I suppose you could say that the white paper does address how you will deal with pressure loss in a pod, just in a way that demonstrates that the authors don't understand the fundamentals of how human lungs work or gases in vacuums behave. Then it gets even better. At 10 minutes 48 seconds, Thunderfoot says, any failure whatsoever will rip through the Hyperloop tube like candy. Uh, yes, even medium-sized bullets will go through the inch-thick steel of the Hyperloop tube. The pod weighs about 30 tons and is going at about the speed of sound. Any sort of crash at that sort of speed will go through an inch-thick steel like it wasn't there. I mean, to give you a feel for what something crashing at 500 miles per hour looks like. Some time ago, whilst testing balls for nuclear reactors, a US research lab decided one of the best ways to do this would be to accelerate a phantom jet up to about 500 miles per hour and crash it into the wall. Now, sure, this is actually a head-on crash, but it does give you a good feel of the energies that you have to dissipate. And yeah, I think we might be slightly beyond airbags and seatbelts here. Further, it's obvious that this is going to create a significant debris field that when the tube is ruptured, will be launched down the tube at about the speed of sound. About the speed of a bullet. Because that's about the speed the air will enter the vacuum tube. So it was really not going to make any difference whether the next capsule down the pipeline has got its brakes on or not. It's still bad news bears. That's important for later. He goes even further, saying any rupture in the tube would lead to a catastrophic failure of the entire Hyperloop tube because air would enter at the speed of sound, destroying all passenger parts in its way. Yep, that is 100% correct. <laughs> even a little hole, you can get a lot of gas going through. So that's three bar. You rip a giant hole in the Hyperloop, it will decompress like it's going boom. Well, first of all, we showed that the structural integrity of steel is much, much higher than what is actually required. So a leak or a rupture is extremely unlikely. <laughs> what? You think that because the tube can hold a vacuum, that somehow means that it can now withstand a pod that weighs about 30 tons, traveling at the speed of sound, disintegrating within the tube. Not quite so sure that holds up as a line of reasoning. But okay, let's just say that a rapture would happen due to some extreme external events, such as a terrorist attack or a meteorite hitting the tube or a failure on the capsule of some sort. In that case, air would indeed enter the Hyperloop tube at high speeds. But this cannot be compared to a bomb explosion, as Thunderfoot puts it. Actually, that's exactly what it can be compared to. It's a difference in pressure traveling at about the speed of sound. 
or if you wanted something where you can extrapolate from something that's more day to day, this man is merely trying to stand up in winds gusting at about 100 miles per hour. So let's say 60 mile per hour winds. The wind coming down the hyperloop is traveling at about the speed of sound, about 600 miles per hour, that sort of thing. So six to 10 times faster than the wind this guy is trying to stand up in, which is why with a pressure wave significantly weaker than the one that the people in the hyperloop are gonna get hit by, and just for frame of reference, one atmosphere is about 15 pounds per square inch. So at 10 pounds per square inch, about two thirds of an atmosphere of a pressure wave, you can get things like limbs blown off, severe heart and lung damage, and reinforced concrete buildings severely damaged. But this cannot be compared to a bomb explosion, as Thunderfoot puts it. An explosion shockwave is highly compressed air. Well, actually, it mostly goes on pressure differentials. So what's it like getting hit by a pressure differential of one atmosphere? Well, let's take a look at it this way. Atmospheric pressure is about 10 tons per meter squared, about the size of a reasonable truck. And that one atmosphere pressure wave coming down the tube towards you is coming towards you at about the speed of sound. The only redeeming feature here is that air, gas, is pretty compressible stuff, but you can still expect it to kill pretty much anything it hits. I mean, you get a rough idea of what a one atmosphere pressure wave will do from some nuke benchmarking tests. Blasts from airbursts where overpressure exceeds 10 PSI can cause substantial damage to destroyer type ships. Above 14 PSI, it could even result in hull rupture, flooding, and sinking. The shock imparted by blast to the superstructure can damage or carry away equipment. At greater distances, overpressure above 6 PSI can distort rupture and carry away light structures and equipment. Interior equipment and compartments may be damaged by the blast, collapsing deck structures or bulkheads. Overpressure entering through openings can damage boilers. Blast injuries to exposed personnel, represented by this dummy, is usually severe over 3 PSI. Here it was 6 PSI. Over to our Elon Musk fans to see how they're going to reinvent physics to conform with the white paper. An explosion shockwave is highly compressed air, whereas the air entering the hyperloop tube enters a medium vacuum. Oh yeah, a medium vacuum, where only 99.9% .9 of the air has been removed. I'm sure that will make a huge difference. But apparently in the fantasy land that you have to live in to make the white paper, all hail to the white oh, paper. <laughs> to make the white paper a document written by a genius. It will. What you're about to witness is probably one of the most surreally bizarre fantasies about how gases in vacuums behave that I've seen anywhere. A medium vacuum. It would thus disperse much, much more. That means that we would see the colder air sink to the bottom in the tube, going first, with the warmer air being on the upper side of the tube and coming later. Therefore, the so-called shock wave wouldn't become a shock wave as in the case of a bump, but more a gradually increasing wind. Uh, yeah, a gradually increasing wind traveling at the speed of sound. I mean, this is just so surreal on every level. Like gas molecules travel at about the speed of sound, which means that if they're given a vacuum, something where there's nothing to collide with, they travel into it at about the speed of sound. So they would go from the bottom of the tube to the top of the tube in milliseconds. I, <laughs> you're not going to get any gradation of this in any way, shape or form. Then, even more surreal, right? cold gas molecules the thing that separates cold gas molecules from hot gas molecules is cold gas molecules move slower. And where does she have her cold gas molecules? That means that we would see the colder air sink to the bottom in the tube, going first, with the warmer air being on the upper side of the tube. Oh, they move the furthest. That's, that's amazing. The slow moving things travel the furthest. I think I can see why you think that the white paper is a brilliant document. Second, we can read on page 55 of the white paper. All hail to the white paper. 
Section 4.5.4. In the event of a large-scale leak, pressure sensors located along the tube would automatically communicate with all capsules to deploy their emergency mechanical braking systems. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm completely sold that that solves all of the technical problems with tube failures. Completely addressed. And one last question, um, Jix, Juan, and Sebastian. Did you invest heavily in Theranos? On page 15 of the white paper, the dimensions of the pot are given by 1.35 times 1.1 meters. So the surface area of a pot would be 1.4 square meters. All glory to the white. Hey, hang on, now wait a sec. 1.4 square meters? Have you any idea how small that is uh, for a form of transport? Using these pods, the ones that are in this genius document, they can have a cross section of 1.4 square meters. Let's just compare that to the size of a normal human. So let's get a, a human up here. Humans are about, on average, about 1.7-ish meters. So for their Hyperloop pod to have this cross section, it's going to have a diameter of about 1.3 meters. Yes, some yoga lessons might be required to take a ride in a Hyperloop. Now, actually, no, wait a second. Let's check this out versus someone sitting down. Now, on the bright side, there's technically two centimeters, about one inch, of potential headspace there. Doesn't quite leave that much space for the uh, emergency air masks that are going to drop down from above, though. And at that, I'm going to call it quits for the moment, because believe it or not, I'm only halfway through their epic tome of stupidity, the epic tome that is Jixuan and Sebastian. Now, if you want me to nail the rest, I'll be more than happy to. Just leave a comment below, and while you're at it, maybe drop a like on the video. However, I am going to cover one thing that they actually get correct. And now I do all the calculations myself on these things, usually from first principles, double, triple check, usually do it from different approaches, just to check that everything is in the right ballpark. But occasionally, numerical errors do slip in there. So in this case, it's off by a factor of 10, because I simply didn't convert between an acceleration of meters per second per second and Gs. Now, if an error like this was significant, I would take the video down, because I care about that sort of thing. In this case, not so important because it makes no difference if you've got a wall of air full of debris coming towards you with the speed of sound. But nonetheless, I did actually in the original video correct this with annotations, but YouTube has since apparently phased them out. Now our heroes here, you know, it's actually noted lots of times in the comments, but whatever, <laughs> get the fact that the numbers are off by a factor of 10 but don't actually spot where the factor of 10 comes from, you know, because we're dealing with smart people here. So they actually plod through the entire calculations to get the exact same numbers I do and say, well, they're off by a factor of 10, but weren't smart enough to work out where the factor of 10 came from. Anyway, whatever. I just wanted to make sure that I covered that that is actually something that is, that's in their video that is actually correct. Uh, now I scroll down to their comments, and now I'm really tempted to do part two. Simply because Smart and Smarter here were going through and favoriting comments saying, yeah, I hate Thunderfoot. And what's this? Thunderfoot is wrong about everything I've ever seen him make an argument on. <laughs> favorited by Dix Juan and Sebastian. Remember. You wanted this. Yeah, so if you want to see part two, make sure you hit subscribe. And if you really like the work of this channel and want to support it directly, you can do it through Patreon. And uh, thanks for watching.